So today we're going to be talking about um, a couple of topics that we uh, didn't get to last time, which was Javadoc and Stack Traces. So you need to add Javadoc to all of your projects, right? So when you're submitting, you're supposed to be writing comments and documenting all of the methods. So I'll briefly go over what Javadoc means, and then we'll talk about Stack Traces really briefly, and then uh, the rest of the the rest of the lecture is going to be about extracting class diagrams again. And so at the very end, we're going to do a lecture lab on that topic. So check out three projects, Space Invaders Refactored, which we've used last time, Demonstrate Stack Traces, which we didn't get to, and then Alarm System, which you'll use for the lecture lab. So what else is going on? Uh, hopefully you're finishing up your phase two, phase one of the project. Phase two is going to start on Monday. Um, We'll go over phase two in detail on Monday. There's a bunch of stuff that you have to do for that one because you're going to be working with Android. So you're going to have to download the Android development kit, install it properly, make sure that it works in your Eclipse. It's going to be like, kind of like lab zero in some sense in order to get yourself started on it. So we'll go over that. And then uh, Wednesday is going to be QA lecture, so come with questions. And the midterm is on Wednesday. Okay, so let's briefly talk about stack traces and Javadoc. So here I have a uh, demonstrate stack trace project opened up. And what I'll do is I'll just run it as a Java application. So if you run this thing, you'll notice that the console will get me back a null pointer exception. And what it prints out below the null pointer exception is a stack trace. And what a stack trace represents is the state of my program at the time that it crashed. So it reached some point in my program, and I can actually, these are hyperlinks, so I can click on them. So if I click on c.java colon 7, that brings me to the seventh line in c.java. And this is where my null pointer expression exception was thrown. It wasn't handled, so my program terminated. So when the program reached this point, this is what was on the stack. So one way of thinking about it is that every time you're executing a method in Java, you're adding to some invisible stack. Every time you're returning from a method, you're removing the element from the stack. So at the time that the program crashed, your stack looked like this. And this is very useful if you want to actually understand how did you actually get to this point in the code. So this is the very top. This is where I am. If I want to look one method up, then I go deeper into the stack and I say, what, what, what came before? So what called c.doit2? And that will bring me to this line in the code. And if I want to know what invoked this, this guy, initialize, I'll click on the next one. So in some sense, I'm, I'm kind of reeling back and coming back layer after layer, peeling away the layers that led me to get, you know, that led me to that specific point in the code where my program crashed. So if you get a null pointer exception or if for some reason your program crashes, you're going to be looking at a lot of stack traces to try to understand what was the control flow that got me there. So essentially your stack trace captures the, the methods along the control flow sequence that got you to that location. All right, so this is very useful to, uh, to know and to inspect in Java. So you'll be seeing a lot of this in, in phase two when your, when your projects crash. Okay, so that's stack traces. So uh, what about Javadoc? So Javadoc, so we know comments, right? So this is a one-line comment, and I can say this is one-line comment. And then I can have multi-line comments, which kind of look like, like so. I can say this is a multi-line comment. So these are just plain comments, and they're not interpreted by Java or really anything. If you want your comments to actually carry some semantic meaning, then you start off a Javadoc comment, and you start off by writing slash and two, two stars instead of one star. So this is, this is a Javadoc comment, and you'll see that it, it shows up in blue as opposed to green. So Javadoc is useful because there's a bunch of tools that actually can process your code 
and then extract the Java doc documentation for your project. So for example, the, uh, the actual official Java documentation that you see online, like the Java documentation for the list interface or the array list, all of these, all of these classes that you've been using, there, it's actually that implementation is derived from the Java doc. So if I do Java list interface, so my Oracle documentation, this page, is actually completely automatically derived from my source code, from my implementation. All right, so it's very useful. There's lots of these tools that help you to extract documentation from your code, which is much easier to look at than the actual code. So you wouldn't want to look at the list interface, actual Java code. Instead, you would look at this documentation. And so in Javadoc, there's a couple of things that you can add, a couple of annotations that you can use to clarify certain things about your code. So at the very top, if instead I use a Java doc here, then you'll notice that it adds a little annotation at author. So this indicates you know, who is the creator of this code. And this is very useful because if you know who wrote it, you know, it wasn't me, it was my partner, right? Then this could be useful for blaming people. This could be useful for inviting people to parties, right? So in general, you just want to know who wrote the code. So add author is one of these tags. The other thing you could do is that if your, prayer, if your method is parameterized, so for example, it takes an integer i. Let's say this was the, the square function, the squaring function. Then if I create a Java doc for a function that takes a parameter, then there'll be an extra at param annotation, which allows me to explain what my parameter is. So typically, the structure of these is that you know, one line comment would go up top. And then here, I would somehow describe i. So my one line comment might be this function returns the square of i. And this is the input i to square. And kind of trivial. Furthermore, if your function actually returns some value, like an integer, I can just have it return zero for now. Then one additional annotation that Javadoc will add is the add return. So this allows me to express what the function actually returns. So for this one, this would be, you know, i times i. The number to square, the function computes, and returns the square. Right? So this may be a complete Java doc for this very simple function. So in general, what we expect from you is that in your project, you're going to be generating these for all of your methods. Right? So you've probably noticed that as your Java code grows and expands, it's actually kind of difficult to read a lot of Java code. So instead, the way we browse your code typically is by clicking on the Java doc tab down here, which will actually do this abstract extraction in real time. So currently, this is what my Java doc contains for this class. And so this is the nice kind of output that I get. So instead of kind of going through the specific methods and the implementation, you can just look at the Java doc tab. And it'll tell me exactly the method, you know, what they do at this really high level, and then how can I use them. So this documentation is really for people who will be using your methods and your partner, since they're going to be probably using them. Okay. Any questions about Javadoc? Cool. It's pretty simple. It's like if you've already been commenting your code, this is just one that kind of the next natural step to do. All right. Let's talk about extracting extracting class diagrams. So in the last lecture, we sort of came up with. Uh, with this class diagram for our Space Invaders game. So this class diagram, we looked at the code, we went through the code one class at a time, and we noticed that there were these relationships between the classes. So the relationship kind of down here at the bottom, this is just your, your standard type hierarchy, right? So subclassing. 
But then these relationships, we have aggregation as a relationship, and then we have association. And one thing, one thing you'll note is that keep talking about ag aggregation composition. So this thing is aggregation. And this is a whole parts relationship that we're talking about. And then there's another version of this, which is shaded, which you might notice in some readings. This is composition. So you do not need to know this. This last one, which is composition. So usually you use composition to denote ownership. So if, um, if you're describing an object that, like, you know, like a screen, a screen on a computer really like, kind of belongs to the computer. There's no way to think about a screen without a computer, you know, if, you're, if you're modeling a computer. So in that case, you would use composition. Whereas an aggregation is kind of like a, like a bag, the stuff that the bag contains. Right? It's perfectly feasible to imagine a bag without oranges. Right? So oranges are not inherent to the bag in any way. But it's very difficult to imagine a computer without a screen. Okay, so the whole parts and then composition. So in this relationship, so why, why would we do something like this? Why extract models from code? What do you guys think? So you can understand it better. Um, yeah, that's one thing. Can you go beyond understanding? <laughs> Trick question. Um, yeah, so like, what, what can you do with this now that you have this diagram? What would be a potential use case for this? So I could stare it, er, at it, kind of like I looked at Java doc, and it might be easier to understand than the code. What can I, what can I infer about my code? Yeah. Expand. Say what? I can expand on it. Yeah, I, I guess I could zoom into one of these, right? And I can say, oh, that's really interesting. You know, score panel uh, seems to be in between Space Invaders and SI game. So let's see how it's using both of those. What else could you do? Like this? Yeah, so it gives you an overview for how things work, right? So it helps you with understanding. No? Make it better. <laughs> All right, I like that one. So it, it can lead you to realize that maybe you could improve your design in some way. Right, so in some sense, you're looking at the blueprints of the software. And it's like you would look at the blueprints for this building. And you might say, huh, actually, if there's, if there's an earthquake, this building will fall down. Hopefully not. Right? But you might look at the software and say, huh, it's not very robust. You know? Or maybe there's a lot of uh, these edges between classes. Maybe I actually want to minimize my dependency in some sense. So you can look at this and then realize that you can actually improve your design in some way and then go back to your code and improve it. So here's an example of this. So down here you see the, the type hierarchy is kind of nice and neat. It's very clean. Right? just very hierarchical. Now the stuff on the left, it seems like a lot of redundancy. So all of these relationships, we also term these couplings. So this is a coupling between Space Invaders and SI Game. And what that means is that Space Invaders knows about SI Game. So if SI Game changes in some way, like if I add a new method or if I rename a method, then it's very likely that I would need to go back to Space Invaders and change that class as well. So there's a dependency between the two classes. And because we have a lot of these edges, that indicates that there's a lot of dependency. There's a lot of coupling between the various classes. So how can I reduce coupling? So reducing coupling means I just want to erase some of these edges, right? So if I see that Space Invaders knows about SI game, 
and Game Panel knows about SI Game, and Space Invaders knows about Game Panel, what if I wanted to just remove this guy, remove this, this edge? Maybe I would say, hey, you know, maybe what Game Panel still needs to access SI Game, but the way I'll do that now is I'll go through Space Invaders. My Space Invaders knows about SI Game. So in effect, what I'll do is I'll make this relationship binary, right? They'll both know about each other, and Game Panel will be able to access the functionality in SI Game through Space Invaders. So let me show this to you in code. So here, Space Invaders are factored. If you open up Game Panel, this class. So Game Panel knows about SA Game, right? And that's, and that's the relationship, the coupling that we saw in that diagram. So how does it use Game? Right, so if we wanted to remove that coupling, we'd have to reason about how is game actually used in this code? Okay, so game, well, it's initialized in the constructor. And then game is used to evaluate whether game is over. Game is used to draw something. And that's it. Those are all my uses of game. So if instead, if I wanted to use my space invader for the same functionality in order to remove that coupling, right? I would need to, first of all, make sure that my game panel knows about Space Invaders. So right now it doesn't. So for that, I would need to say, well, let me get an argument into my constructor, which is Space Invaders. Let's say SI. So I'll keep a private Space Invader instance, SI. And so instead of initializing game here, I'll initialize SI. So now that I know SI, whenever I use game, I actually want to use SI instead. So let me open up Space Invaders. So here's Space Invaders code. Doesn't quite fit. But Space Invaders knows about game, right? Just like just like game panel. So well, first of all, this initializer for game panel fails right now because game panel no longer takes a game. It takes this, which is the space invaders. And now if I wanted to check if game is over in game panel, I would add a method in space invaders that would check if game is over. So it'd simply be a public boolean is over. And I'll simply pass the call to game. Just do return game is over. So on the game panel side, where I'm checking if game is over, instead I'll do, I'll run the same code with SI. Right, so I changed my coupling. So now I no longer have the dependency on game for this specific call. And I have to find other uses of game. So here's another one where I draw a graphic. So I do something very similar where I create a function, it's going to be a void, and it's going to draw, you know, a graphic, or maybe just draw, and it will take a graphic as a parameter, and then simply pass this graphic to the draw method in game. Probably have to import it. Oh, it's graphics. Still have to import it. Okay? So here, instead of using game to draw, I'll use my Space Invaders to draw. So now that I've done this refactoring, I can actually completely eliminate my game, my game field within game panel. So what I just did kind of going back to this, to this diagram, is I eliminated one of these edges between game panel and SI game. So 
So I eliminated it and I made this relationship bidirectional. And I could do this again for score panel, right? So I could just as well eliminate this guy and then make this relationship bidirectional. And so what I'm doing is I'm actually changing my design. My game, you know, it still does the same thing. It's still the same game. I'm not actually changing the behavior. So this is, all of this is just refactoring. So when we refactor code, we change our code with the intent of making it, you know, easier to understand or better designed. We're not changing the actual semantics of the code. It still behaves in the same way. So if we were to eliminate these two edges, then we have less coupling in our system. So that means all of the UI components in my system kind of go through my Space Invaders class. And then all of my logic, all of my model is to the right and it's isolated and it only talks to SA game. So this would be a strictly better design, right? Because I eliminated coupling. So now if I change SI game, I only have to change Space Invaders. I don't actually have to change game panel, score panel. Okay. Yeah. Is it still a good design if, when you refactor the game and SI game, instead of creating new functions, you just make a new function called get game, and then you just call get game dot um, It actually so that brings up a ghost dependency, right? So in a sense, you would have you would still have a coupling between game panel and SI game. You would know about it within those methods. Right? So the key here is to actually make sure that game panel doesn't know that SA game exists at all. It doesn't even know the type. So if you look in my game panel code, the type SA game does not appear anywhere in that code. I want to do that to remove dependency between the two. So if your partner goes ahead and changes SA game and you're working on game panel, you can change anything you want. Right, your game panel is going to be completely isolated and independent of these changes. And this is true in large software systems. So when you have a, a large team working on a big software artifact, ideally you would partition it and modularize it so that different people can work on different parts of the system at the same time. But if you have a lot of dependency, everything depends on everything else, you, know, you can only process one change at a time. Because if everybody starts changing things, you know, your, your system will never work. So this is a more robust design in the sense that I could change something on this side and wouldn't influence, it wouldn't impact these other classes. So for the midterm, you do have to know how to extract this diagram from the code. But you do not need to know how to modify the code to reflect better design, right? Okay, so now I think we're ready for our lecture lab. So the lecture lab is you should check out the alarm system. And, and here it is. As before, you can raise your hand and I'll walk around.
So next time. Yeah, yeah. sure. Uh,
All right. Let's try to uh, let's try to go through this. you guys want to start? So here's my alarm system. So what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to start with the model, right, and extract the class diagram for the model package. Okay? So let's just go in alphabetical order. Alarm. Sounds like a good one to start with. So you have alarm. That's somewhere here. Mid screen, right? So I have alarm. My alarm extends observable. If it extends observable, that's a that's a subclass relationship right there, right? So I have this this funny arrow, right? That is unfilled, and it goes up to observable. And, and then you list your, your methods underneath, right, in the, in the lower box, lower part of the box. If I look at observable, what does my observable know about? It's an abstract class. The abstract class knows about some number of observers. How many? In order to answer that question, you have to look at the constructor. So if I look in the constructor, I see that observers is initialized to be a list. And I never create or add any actual observers. So that list of observers, initially it starts off being empty. And perhaps later on, I can actually add some observers to that list. So that means that the relationship is 0 to n. Right? An observable knows about 0 or more observers. And this relationship is an aggregation because an observer really contains a bunch of these observers. So aggregation versus association, it's difficult to actually figure that out. It's a complex, complex question. And there's no automated way of actually doing this. And the problem is that the, the difference between the two is semantics, semantical. So if you give a computer, you know, if you, if you tell someone, I have a computer screen and I have a computer, what is the relationship between the two? If the person ever used a computer, they'll, then they'll know. But if the person has never seen a computer, then they'll say, well, who knows? You know, maybe I could have a screen without a computer and a computer without a screen. So it's unclear. So you have to know something about the system and the domain that you're modeling in order to know that, in order to answer that question. What's the difference between n and asterisk? n and asterisk. So when we write 0 dot 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 n, can't see any of that. 0 dot 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 n, then that's the same thing as an asterisk. So an asterisk is a shorthand for 0 dot 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 n. Wait, but then why is over there 0 dot dot asterisk? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's a mixture of notation. So you could replace this whole thing with an asterisk. Right? You couldn't replace 1 dot dot asterisk with an asterisk. So in general, how many of you know regular expressions? Right, the powerful few. Okay, so regular expressions, really good to know. Okay, so this symbol in, in mathematical logic, it's called the Kleene stars after a mathematician named Kleene. And in regular expressions, uh, which you'll cover eventually in computer science, it stands for any item of a set or no item. Okay, so when I'm writing star, it's really intended to say that this list could either be empty, it could have no things in it, or it could have any one 
finite number of things. Okay, so here it's actually abused a little, so when I write zero dot dot star, the star really means that it could be any number. Right, so for any number in the set one to infinity. So that's my relationship between observable and my observer interface. What else can we look at? Let's look at the controller. That's a really messy one. So the controller knows about a bunch of things. It has these collections, right? So remember, a collection is simply, is simply an interface. Was it an interface or abstract class? It's an interface in Java land, which represents sets and lists and all these things, right? So just represents something that has multiple items. So right away, you know that there's going to be you know, zero more code, zero more sensors. And then you have to kind of confine that and actually understand, what, does it start at zero? Does it start at five? What is the actual, what is the actual number limit? So <coughs> alarm controller knows about some alarm codes and some sensors. So you have sensors up here, and then you have alarm code up here. So if you look inside the constructor, you'll see that I actually initialize both to be hash sets, so non-countable collection, non-ordered collection. I create an alarm, and I add a new alarm code to my list of codes. So alarm codes is going to start at one, dot, dot, star, because I could have many more things in that set. But sensors starts at zero because I don't know how many sensors I will have. But initially, I start at zero. And then I know exactly about one alarm. Right, so this is why there's the, this is why there's exactly this, this one next to alarm. OK, so just keep doing this. And eventually, you'll get this beautiful large diagram. Or maybe not as beautiful. OK? Questions? You do not need to know the difference between composition and aggregation. So you have to, in the diagram, you have the black uh, diamond. That's right. So for this black diamond and the empty diamond, any is fine, right? So in our, from our perspective, we only taught you about the empty diamond. So if you use the empty diamond where the black diamond is supposed to be, it's, it's completely fine. Other questions? How do you figure out what? How do you figure out whether it's aggregation or composition? How do you know that it's aggregation? Yeah, so, so it comes down to whether you know, it's part of a whole or it really owns the object. So the reason it's a, the reason it's a black diamond here is because there's ownership. Because this alarm code is actually owned by the alarm controller. No other object references it, so that's an ownership relationship. Okay. It's usually if it's, it's an isolated class, that's not referenced by anyone. At zero, zero on Monday.